Amazing Beds is our company for this particular pre-scene. And this is a company that manufactures and sells beds and mattresses. Okay, so we're going to walk through over the course of these sessions, each page of this particular document. So we're going to go through it in great detail. As I said, the idea is to expose you to as many ideas as possible uh, so that you are flexible ahead of the exam and that you've been exposed to lots and lots of ideas to relate each of the points in this pre-scene to relevant theory from E1, F1 and P1 to talk through uh, likely exam scenarios and to discuss the implications of what's included in this document. Okay, so over the years I've analysed about 45 pre-scene analyses and uh, in that time I've learned a thing or two about what constitutes good preparation for the uh, exam and what constitutes good analysis of a pre-scene. So let's get right into it. Your role as a finance officer working within the finance department of Amazing Beds. So you're pretty low down the food chain, so to speak. You are starting out, uh, you know, as a lowly finance officer, you're going to be reporting into managers and senior managers. You might interact with the odd director here and there. Many of your interactions are likely to be with other finance colleagues, but you should not be surprised if occasionally you get a, a request on the day of the exam from a HR person, a marketing person, etc. And if that is the case, you need to be careful and adopt the mindset of a finance officer and also keep in mind who it is you're speaking to. So if you're discussing with a HR person, the pros and cons of an activity-based costing system. You need to be careful. It's not the same as discussing it with a finance manager because the finance manager will understand what ABC is, but a HR person doesn't necessarily understand it. So if that was the case, you were discussing ABC with a HR manager, you would unpack the terminology and explain briefly what ABC actually means before you would get into the pros and cons of ABC. Okay, so that's just an aside for the moment. So you're a finance officer and you are mostly involved in the preparation of management accounts. So that's P1 covered. Okay. You think, fine. Okay. They're narrowing my focus here. I can just focus on P1, right? Wrong. Unfortunately, uh, it's not as easy as that because you also prepare financial statements from time to time and you respond to queries that people have on financial reporting. So we're bringing in F1 here. And more than that, you're expected to provide information to managers who uh, to assist them with their decision making. So you're not the decision maker in this business, are you? You are a finance officer. You're involved in the operations, the day-to-day -day execution of tasks, short-term focus, okay? And the people higher up, the managers, the senior managers, the directors, they are the, the decision makers, but they're going to need high quality inputs and they're going to need high quality information from you in relation to the operational side of the business to make sensible strategic decisions. So what you're doing in this case is you are assisting decision makers. You're not the one making decisions. You are assisting decision makers. Okay. Um, so let's discuss this finance officer role in a little bit more depth. As I said, You've got a short-term focus. Let's think about the different levels of SEMA for a minute. You've got the operational level, you've got the management level, and you've got the strategic level. Now, when you get to the strategic level, your focus is going to be on the long-term strategic success of your business. So that's a three to five year time horizon. Um, you're going to be thinking about, you know, the markets you need to go into, uh, your pricing strategy, new product categories, etc. With the management level, it's more about the medium term, maybe one year focus. You're talking about longer term financing, putting that in place, etc. And you're kind of engaging more with the leaders of the business. But at the operational level, it's still about the day to day. So it's a short term focus, three to six months, short term financing, cash management. Okay. And um, 
you're going to be looking at budgets in detail with a three, six, maybe 12 month time horizon. You're going to get questions most likely on variance analysis. So you'll be asked to compare budget figures with actual figures and discuss the deviations between the two, the very common questions in the operational case study on that. Costing is going to be important. So comparing and contrasting um, activity-based costing, which is a more modern uh, form of um, costing with traditional absorption costing, which is actually the um, uh, uh, costing system that this company uses. Um, so cash management is important as well and managing risk in the short term, three, six, maximum 12 months. So that is your role as a finance officer summed up. You're, you're assisting the decision makers. You have a short term focus. Now let's think about um, some important theories from E1, for example, because E1 is a subject that has changed quite a bit um, since the introduction of the new syllabus. It's changed more than P1 and F1 have. Uh, they're largely the same, but E1 has introduced some um, new areas covering digital technology. So I want you to keep that to the fore of your mind as we work through this pre-scene. It's quite likely that SEAM will be testing um, that new syllabus topic, you know, anything related to, to uh, digital, digital technologies and using technology to create value and to preserve value. Just an aside as well, uh, for the moment, this should go without saying, but it's worth repeating. It's very important that you demonstrate um, sound ethical judgment as a finance officer. It's no good if you make recommendations that make business sense, but are on ethical. You need to be making um, recommendations that obviously make good business sense, but are also ethically sound. So watch out for any ethically quest questionable suggestions from other people. So you might get, uh, you know, a manager through maybe his or her own misunderstanding wants to do something unethical. They want you to, I don't know, they want you to um, depreciate an asset over a very, very long term uh, time horizon to reduce, um, you know, the expenses hitting, the depreciation expense hitting the profit and loss so that the company um, gives an artificially high profit figure for the year. Okay. Um, and, you know, that could be an innocent mistake. Um, you know, maybe they think it's, you know, completely subjective, um, the, um, the depreciation rate that you apply. Um, they mightn't just understand it. So, you want to be drawing on your technical know-how and referring to IAS 16, property, plant and equipment. Um, but you also want to be, um, you know, letting them know that it would be unethical, um, you know, to, to do something like that. Refer to the SEMA Code of Ethics. E1, SEMA Code of Ethics, you've got the five principles, objectivity, professional competence, um, confidentiality, integrity, professional behavior. I in a scenario like that, you know, you'd be referring to, uh, you know, uh, you know, making um, a sound professional judgment. So you'd be drawing maybe on professional competence there, but also you'd be talking about uh, integrity as well as being important there. Okay, so that's the introductory section of the pre-scene. Let's move on. And we're given a little bit more information about our particular business here. So amazing beds. We're told that Amazing Beds is based in Eastland, so completely fictional country, in the non-fictional continent, of course, of Europe, uh, with a fictional currency, so the E-dollar. We don't know anything about, you know, exchange rates. Is this a one-to-one -one with the euro? Uh, impossible to tell, um, but there we go. It's the E-dollar, Eastland. So what do we know about Eastland? Well, we're told, uh, I believe at some stage, that it's quite a developed uh, economy, or rather the implication would be if, you know, if it's based in Europe, it's going to be pretty well developed. And of course, there are pros and cons that come with that. So the pros would relate to Eastland most likely having quite good infrastructure. So roads, buildings, etc. Their education system would likely be quite good as well. So that would mean, you know, a pretty highly skilled workforce for a company like Amazing Beds to recruit from. Also, it's going to mean that their customers 
have pretty high purchasing power. So, you know, that's obviously all positive. Now, on the cons side, with quite a developed economy like this, it's probably going to translate in, in, into higher factor costs. So they're going to need to pay their um, workers more. It's going to cost more to produce what they're producing. And it's quite likely as well that Eastland would have quite stringent regulations, which is obviously a cost of doing uh, business. So uh, we're told that the company, first of all, sells mattresses and beds through its network of 120 stores uh, throughout Eastland and indeed through its own website. So, as I said, E1, all things digital an important consideration with the new E1 syllabus. And already we're seeing here the potential role for technology uh, for this particular business. So they're not just selling through physical stores, they're selling through their website as well. So the digital strategy is going to be important. Uh, it's the country's largest bed and mattress retailer based on revenue, we're told. So good news early on. This is a, a pretty major company. And Amazing Beds, we're told, they sell all of the major brands of mattresses and beds, as well as their own brands. So not just selling, but they're manufacturing as well. So they're doing both. They're a retailer, but they're also manufacturing at their, uh, at their factory in Eastland. And we're told, interestingly, in this first paragraph as well, that the company is not selling mattresses outside of Eastland. Okay. So let's unpack this first paragraph here in this introductory section a little bit. We've talked about Eastland and the relevance of that for our business. What we're seeing here is a business that is doing two big things. They're selling and they're manufacturing, okay? So they need to get those two things right. And we're going to be discussing the importance of their retail presence, the experience in the stores, and I think they're doing that pretty well. The signals are throughout this pre-scene that they're quite good at that. They manage the customer well um, and they create a pretty good customer experience in their stores. I think what they're doing less well, and don't worry because we'll unpack all of this as we work through the pre-scene, what they're doing less well is the manufacturing side of the business. There are in lots of indications that they have very outdated um, production techniques and there, there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, I think it's very interesting that they're only selling within Eastland. They're the number one player in Eastland. And in the next paragraph, we're going to see, I, I wonder, I raise the question whether they're reaching saturation point in their domestic market. And I think it might be the case now that they're uh, overly reliant on that one market of Eastland. So, you know, if a big recession hits in Eastland or whatever, uh, it's going to impact the purchasing power of their customers and people might start holding off and buying beds and mattresses. Uh, they'll hold off for a couple of years to replace their current mattresses, for example. So I think it's a very likely exam scenario um, that the company starts to explore selling outside of their domestic territory. And an obvious way into other new markets is through the website because it allows them to sell. Of course, if you've got a website, you're not constrained in the same way you are with physical stores. You can reach any market in the world, um, uh, you know, potentially. So that gives them a an easier way into new markets. Of course, they need to set up distribution networks, etc., in new markets. But the website is their window for the rest of the world to look through. So that's their way in. Uh, and I think uh, it's quite a likely exam scenario. So let's keep that one in mind early on. So let's talk about the history of the company uh, in the next paragraph. So we're told that um, the company was founded in 1978. So what's that? 40 years ago, a little bit over 40 years ago. So clearly the company is staying power. It was founded by George Norton, started out with a single store uh, selling furniture. But he soon realized, given the requests from customers, that a lot of the interest was in mattresses and beds, okay? And by 1982, just four years later, the company had shifted its focus to just mattresses and beds. And by 1990, the company had actually opened their own factory. So the production facility where they manufactured their own mattresses and beds, and um, so at that stage, by 1990, they actually had 40 retail stores open. And by 2000, they had 100 stores throughout the country. So what George did was 
He sold the company in 2005. He found a private equity investor, sold 100% of the business, and off he rode into the sunset with his millions and to enjoy his retirement. Good for George. So he's no longer involved, okay? The private equity investor, however, still is the owner of 100% of the shares of the business. Interesting, okay? So let's unpack this paragraph a little bit. What strikes me here is the rapid growth early on and a hint perhaps that the company is reaching saturation point in Eastland, okay? So think about it. Company started in 1978. Uh, in 12 years, so by 1990, they had 40 stores. So they've added 40 retail stores. Great, great start. Over the next 10 years to 2000, they ramp up that growth. So rapid growth. Um, and they open another 60 retail stores. Okay, great. Then over the next 20 years, so from 2000 to 2020, they open only 20 retail stores. And in that period, we've got the private equity investor coming in and taking 100% of the shares. So what's going on here? The growth is slowing, clearly. As I said, I feel that they might be reaching saturation point in their domestic territory, and that would indicate that it might be a good time to start exploring other markets. Private equity is interesting. Okay, so with a private equity company, an investor comes along, typically they'll buy the entire business. And the idea is that they will streamline operations. So they'll often cut um, what they deem to be unnecessary. They'll often make people redundant and they'll try to, you know, um, try to ensure that there's a leaner, meaner um, company that comes out the other side of the takeover. Um, they'll often buy very mature companies uh, and do this. So often they've had a bad reputation over the years as being kind of corporate raiders. They come along, uh, they got a company, they fire lots of staff, uh, and they want to make then a, a sale and a big, big profit after five or six years of having done that. So typically they'll exit after several years. The idea is that they will sell or list the company in the stock exchange and they'll make a ton of money. Um, so typically the holding period might be five, six, seven years. This business has been held for 15. So we might be thinking, this private equity investor, how long more are they going to hold the shares of this business before they look for a return? Now, I wouldn't be surprised if this particular private, equi private equity investor came along, saw this runaway growth and saw all of the opening of these stores and kind of thought, this, is, this company is kind of undisciplined now. They're opening too many stores. You know, they're adding a lot of cost. Let's slow things down. Let's streamline operations uh, and, um, you know, make the company more profitable. And the company is definitely profitable, as we'll see when we look at the financial statements. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if the private equity investor is looking, um, you know, to offload its shares, maybe an IPO or something like that in the coming years. And uh, with private companies, of course, there are pros and cons, you know, compared to... Uh, um, you know, publicly listed companies. The pros would relate to, you know, limited liability. Um, you know, control of the company can't be lost to outsiders unless it's agreed by the shareholders. Uh, the cons of being a private company is that financial information can actually still be inspected by the public once the financial statements are actually filed with the register. Uh, but that includes uh, competitors as well. So any competing companies um, uh, with the same kind of um, structure as Amazing Beds would also have their financial statements uh, publicly available as well. Okay, let's move on. We're told that the aim of the business is to continue to be the number one retailer of mattresses and beds in Eastland. Again, I think that's interesting because the big aim of the company is just to kind of stay the same. So no major progress in sight. It's just kind of, let's, let's just keep what we have. And really the only way is down in their home market when you think about it. Um, so again, that kind of points to me to the importance of exploring going into new markets if they want um, good growth in the future. So the way they want to maintain their number one position is, first of all, by offering a full product range of their own mattresses and beds and the major um, brands of mattresses and beds that are made by other companies. Um, secondly, 
making sure the customer service is excellent in their stores. So that means having retail staff that are really well trained and provide lots of support to customers and they're educating customers and they want to make their retail stores leading on from this point user friendly. They want to make them simple to navigate. It, they want to make it easy to understand for the customer and, um, you know, the, how to differentiate between, you know, the pros and cons of different mattresses and beds, etc. I don't know about you, but I'm not an expert on mattresses, or at least I wasn't before this pre-scene. So if I went into a furniture store and I was looking at different mattresses, they all kind of look the same to me. And um, so that's an important point to keep in mind. In this industry, each um, seller of mattresses has a job to do, convincing um, customers, you know, that this mattress here, even though it looks the same as this other mattress, is worth $400, uh, $400 more. Okay, so you're going to have a job convincing someone that that is the case or that these mattresses that we sell that look exactly the same as that rival company, but the rival company is selling for 50% lower. Well, actually, there's a reason why our mattresses are uh, much more expensive. So it's all about educating the customer and you really need to keep it simple. So you're not looking to, um, you know, turn your customers into experts on mattresses. That's an unrealistic aim uh, in you know, the 10 minutes or so or the 15 minutes that where your retail staff have the customer one-on-one, -on -one, you want to keep it really simple. Uh, so you want um, a number of very obvious indicators of quality um, to justify the higher price you're looking to charge. And look, they have that. So they've got this color coding system on mattress information to identify the types of mattress and the features. And later on, we'll see they kind of have a star rating system, five stars, four stars, etc. That's great. That's what, that's what I need if I go into a mattress store. I need something really, really simple. I need to be banged over the head with something that's really easy to understand if I'm going to pay more for this mattress compared to the other mattress I saw that looks the exact same. So what the company is trying to do is they're also trying to stand out from the crowd. There are lots of um, online retailers of mattresses that have sprung up, uh, excuse the pun, in recent years. And they're trying to create a unique customer experience and they're trying to justify higher prices. So at the manufacturing facility, we're told that Amazing Beds manufactures its own brand of sprung mattresses, hybrid mattresses, and divan beds. Don't worry, we'll discuss what all of the, those terms mean soon. They have a small R&D team that's always looking at how to improve mattress technology. Uh, you know, I was surprised to see, you know, this expression, mattress technology, but it's becoming quite a thing, okay? The materials that go into a mattress, uh, even smart mattresses uh, and smart sleep technology is becoming a thing connected uh, to, you know, uh, internet uh, and uh, other smart devices. So that is an area of growth, undoubtedly, and the company needs to be keeping an eye on that. We're told that approximately 30% of the company's revenue and 33% of its gross profit come from their own mattresses and their own beds, the ones they're actually manufacturing. Now, that indicates to me, you know, that obviously they're more profitable, perhaps, than the uh, other brands that they're selling. So they're not paying a premium, obviously, for their own mattresses. Whereas the mattresses that they're buying in from other manufacturers, obviously those other manufacturers need to make a profit. So you need to compensate them. So they're less profitable. Um, but the own mattresses, they represent 30% of revenue, but even more in the gross profit area. So that means probably that the company can secure cost savings and secure higher profits if they were to manufacture more of their own mattresses and beds. And that's a point I will come back to later in the pre scene. So revenue, we're told, for the year to the end of June 2020 was $174 million. 64% of that was for mattresses and 36% for beds. So mattresses is the big area, more so than beds. And the company is employing 1,160 people with the split as follows. So most of those people, almost the majority, 50% exactly, are working in retail. 
So that points to the importance of the retail experience for this business. Most of the employees, or uh, um, half of them, are working in those stores, engaging with customers, trying to convince them to part with their money for a mattress that looks the same as all other mattresses, okay? Trying to justify a higher price. 25% are working in the factory, 15% are working in logistics, and 10% are working at head office in other support areas, such as finance. So you're working in that 10% segment at head office. So we're presented here with the team of directors running the business. So these are the decision makers. It's possible that you will engage with one or two of these on the day of your exam. Uh, bear in mind, as I said before, that if you're dealing with someone who's not from a finance area, just be careful to um, you know, to explain certain financial terms that you might use. Don't assume that they understand um, what something from F1 or P1 actually is. Uh, you don't need to spend a long, long time unpacking the term. Uh, just, you know, two to three lines just to explain at a high level what a certain F1 or P1 theory is. Okay, the directors. You've got the CEO, first of all, Ben DeLuca. Now, Ben came on the scene in 2005 which is interesting because that's when the private equity investor came on the scene too. So probably what happened was the private equity investor appointed Ben as their go-to guy. This is their appointee most likely. Now, he might have come in with the instruction from the private equity investor to get costs down, to improve efficiencies because they wanted a more profitable operation. And that may well have been the case. So Ben has been on the scene for 15 years. So he's got experience in the role. Um, he's been involved in the furniture business for a long, long time. And he is the key point of contact with the private equity investor. So they're obviously a major, major stakeholder. They need to be uh, kept uh, informed of um, everything going on at the business. And it's interesting here that Ben has an, a big interest in all things green, and in ethical issues surrounding the mat mattress production and recycling. Okay, so we're touching on points from E1 here. SEMA code of ethics in relation to any ethical issues. So that could relate to, for example, a supplier that the company is working for, um, where it's discovered that they are using environmentally unfriendly um, production techniques, they're polluting a lot, and the decision needs to be made whether you need to keep working with that supplier or whether you need to cut them. And, you know, someone might come along and say, yeah, you know, they, they offer such a good price. Let's just keep working with them and keep it hush, hush. So you would have an ethical dilemma presenting itself there. And of course, as well, in relation to, you know, being environmentally responsible, we're touching on corporate social responsibility, which is an E1 topic. So I think, you know, recycling is going to be an important area for this particular pre-scene. Later in the pre-scene, it's mentioned that only 20% of mattresses in Eastland are actually recycled. So that obviously um, creates the, the, the impression that there is a lot of room for improvement. So Ben might be leading the charge here, uh, you know, that the company needs to recycle more of its mattresses and they could potentially save money there and do what is right for the environment. So that would be a likely exam scenario. Then we've got the retail director, key person here, Mina Patrick. So Mina's been around for a long time. She's been at the company for 25 years. She started as an assistant store manager. So she worked on the ground. She seems to know this area uh, inside out. That would be the expectation. She's responsible for the operation of all 120 retail stores. And she is keen to ensure that the customer experience is easy and pleasurable. So the ambience in the store is really important. And that word again, easy, keep it simple. You know, the color coding system, a star rating system. Don't overwhelm the customer with jargon. Don't confuse them with the industry terminology related to, you know, the makeup of the mattress, et cetera, et cetera. You want to keep it simple. And uh, you have a far better chance then of converting your visitors into buyers, okay? So a great way to differentiate um, the company from online retailers who don't have the ability, you know, to grab the customer and to walk them through a physical store and have them touch 
the mattresses and the beds and, you know, the smell of the store, even the whole experience uh, and to engage with a, a retail, a knowledgeable retail worker in the way that um, Amazing Beds is able to do. So 25 years of experience, she's likely to have an intimate, intimate understanding of the customers and products. And very, very interesting here, it says that she's knowledgeable about sleep science and wellness and she wants the company to expand in these areas. So we're going beyond um, your regular mattresses and beds. You know, we, we're going into the area of technology. Now, does the business have that know-how in company? Probably not. You're talking about software developers there. Uh, the company may need to either uh, engage with a an external group of consultants or a team of software developers, or if they really want to make a big play in this area, they might want to hire some software developers. Um, and that's obviously going to be costly. So it raises the question, how would they finance this kind of research and development? They've got a small R&D team at the moment. Maybe they need to ramp that up if they're serious about, you know, making smart mattresses that are connected to your smartphone, uh, your wearable devices like your smartwatches, etc. And, you know, there's obviously going to be a lot of marketing associated with breaking into this area. Um, so a lot of expenditure required, a lot of investment. So how do they finance that? That will become apparent when we look at the financial statements. And wellness, that's an interesting word. So we're going beyond just, we're selling beds, we're selling mattresses. What you're selling actually is peaceful sleep. You're selling well-being, you're selling health. Okay, so that's all part of the brand and the market, the marketing messaging that you're getting across to your consumers. Next up, we have the production director, Gavin Thorpe. He's been around only for six months, but has a lot of uh, his relevant experience in the industry. He used to work for a rival manufacturer, Z Sleep in Eastland, and he is responsible for the entire production facility. And I think he's his work cut out there. It's a primary activity in the value chain. You might recall the value chain from your E1 studies, uh, Michael Porter. And he's interested in product design and he's ex uh, keen to expand the range of mattresses and beds made at the manufacturing facility. So as I said before, uh, the signs are, I think, that the company, because of the profitability of their own manufactured beds and mattresses, they might want to ramp up production of their own beds and mattresses. And later on, we'll see in the pre-scene that, co that customers seem to be very satisfied with the manufactured beds and mattresses made by Amazing Beds. Again, an indication that the company would do well to expand production in their manufactured beds and mattresses. And currently, they're not manufacturing many types of beds and many types of mattresses, so they can definitely uh, go into new types of mattresses and beds. So he's new to the company, good industry experience, and has plenty of insights, I think, into product design and expanding into new mattresses and beds at the production there. Purchasing director Mo Singh is up next. Okay, so responsible for the purchase of raw materials, but also um, you know, completed products bought in from other manufacturers. So these are the other beds and other mattresses made by other uh, companies. So she's built up excellent relationships with the company's suppliers over the years. And this is actually the first of two mentions in the pre-scene that relationships with suppliers are excellent. Okay, so they need to ensure that that continues to be the case. However, just a little aside here early on, just flagging it up. Uh, when we see in the we'll see in the financial statements later on that the payable days is creeping up. It's very very high, and it actually exceeds the credit terms offered by most suppliers. So what the company is doing is actually it's lagging its payments more and more to its own suppliers. Now that's a little bit of a dangerous game. While it's good for your cash position, it's not necessarily good for your relationships with your suppliers. You know, if you're taking two months or three months instead of one, the, the agreed one month to pay your bills to your suppliers, you're going to annoy them. So that needs to be balanced with the need to, you know, keep cash in the business. Marketing. So, um, you know, this relates to the brand, the power of the brand. So that's important in distinguishing this company from its rivals. Uh, we've got Helene Hugo. She's been around for five years. She used to work at one of the largest 
marketing agencies in Eastland. So good mix of experience and education just throughout the board in general. Uh, I think, you know, there are good signs that we've the right people in place here. She works closely with Mina Patrick on the branding of the business. So Mina, responsible for the retail experience and, you know, the marketing director has lots of input there because it impacts so, um, so um, profoundly on the brand, the experience in the store. And she was instrumental, we're told, in relaunching the company's brand four years ago. So again, marketing, a primary activity in Porter's value chain, so you need to get it right. Jack Norton, he's been around for 25 years. He's the logistics director, so responsible for the uh, delivery fleet of vans that the company has and, you know, getting um, getting the products out to customers on time um, and transporting, um, you know, transporting beds and mattresses all around the country. And actually, there are indications that the company is not doing that as well as it could be. I was actually surprised when I saw the lead times for this business. It's taking them seven days um, to, to even ship mattresses in the best case scenario. And it's taking up to two weeks to, for, um, sometimes to ship mattresses, you know, um, not the best lead time. So I think this is an area definitely where the business needs to be improving. There's mention here of an, an interesting um, an interesting project that is underway. There is a move to replace the entire delivery fleet of vans at the moment um, with hybrid vehicles. So we're moving away from um, petrol to hybrid vehicles. So far more env environmentally friendly. So that is in line with what the CEO wants. Great demonstrating they're environmentally friendly, they're good corporate citizen, they're responsible, all of that, fantastic. But this initiative is only 35% complete. That's a red flag. Pay attention to that because I think this is a likely exam scenario. You're going to be faced, quite likely, I think, in one of the variants on the day of the exam with completing this particular project. We need to finish out the remaining 65%. Uh, you know, we need to find the cash to do this. We need to manage this project in the right way. How do you recommend we do this? Okay, so that's definitely a likely exam scenario. Next up, we have finance director Stephen Tang, uh, who I'm sure doubles up as a Bond villain or something in uh, uh, from the look of his profile picture. He is a serious looking can uh, personality here, I think. Uh, if he manages... Uh, he, the finances of the company as tightly as uh, as he's as he's holding back uh, a smile there. I think uh, you know the company's in good hands. So uh, very well qualified, I think, for uh, the role of finance director. He's been a qualified accountant for fifteen years, but also kind of dabbles in more than dabbles in. Has responsibility even for IT at the company. So he has a lot of expertise. We're told in IT. And he's supported by a team of external consultants is responsible for the company's IT systems. OK, um, also, you know, looking after internal, external reporting that falls under, you know, the area of finance. Great. But I do wonder whether he's the right person for IT. Um, if he needs the support, for example, of external consultants um, might indicate that, you know, there are some. Uh, gaps in his know-how, would it be better to appoint a separate IT director? I think that it would be. If the company is serious, for example, about its website strategy, especially if it wanted, for example, to break into new markets and was leading with its website strategy, then there's justification for an IT director. If, for example, it's serious about making a play in smart mattresses and it's going to need to employ a team of software developers or something like that, absolutely you want a separate IT director. So keep that in mind. If they're making big plays in the area of technology, get an IT director in and leave Stephen to run finance uh, alone. Okay. We've got the HR director, Carl Baptiste next. So Carl, is he's worked for the company for seven years and in a variety of HR roles, uh, he's worked for the last 30 years in different companies. And just looking at his profile picture, he's held up remarkably well. I mean, 30 years, that would put him probably in his mid-50s or beyond. And uh, fair play to Carl. He's, he's looking pretty good for a, a guy in his mid-50s. Um, obviously not too stressed out. Uh, he's an expert in employment law and very keenly interested in employee welfare. 
Okay, he's actually started a number of initiatives that have sought to improve this. Think back to E1 and the area of HR. Okay, so um, managing your employees well, ensuring that they are uh, satisfied and motivated. So it's not just about ensuring that they're well paid. Now that's important, but it's kind of a hygiene factor. Okay, um, you know, drawing on um, E1 terminology. Um, you want to go beyond that. You want to ensure that they're actually motivated, satisfied, that they have some responsibility, that they're engaged, uh, and that will ensure that they're loyal to your company. Now, I'm just going to flag up a, a potential exam scenario here as well. I think, uh, and we'll see this in a few slides' time, there is definite, definite room for improvement in the production facility. The company needs to automate more of uh, what's going on in the factory. And of course, the danger with automation is that you're going to have to lay people off. Now that falls under Carl's area. If we've got a scenario on the day of the exam where we're automating more of the factory uh, the factory and production, and we're going to need to lay off 10% of the employees or 20% of the employees, that is a very delicate uh, task. Um, and that would fall, as I said, under Carl's area of expertise. And he might be coming to you for assistance uh, on, on that. So just keep that in mind. How do you ensure that, um, first of all, is it necessary to lay people off or could they be redeployed in other areas? Um, and secondly, if you are going to lay people off, how is it handled well? How do you ensure that it's done right so that the remaining employees, their motivation, their morale is not too negatively affected? Okay. Okay. So, looking at the next page, we're looking at a little bit more detail at the production and finance teams. So, just by the looks of things here, it seems that the organizational structure of the business is a kind of functional business structure with, you know, the different uh, activities grouped together. Production is all grouped together. Um, uh, you know, finance, the finance area is grouped together. You've got specialists in each area engaging with one another. They get very, very good at that particular area. So that kind of functional business structure is very suitable for smaller companies um, that are quite centralized and quite stable environments with fewer product offerings. I think this business kind of ticks a number of those boxes. It's not a massive, massive business, although it's, you know, not a tiny business either. Um, it's a relatively stable environment, although it remains to be seen with the introduction of things like smart mattresses and, you know, the technology into the business, whether it actually becomes uh, quite a disruptive industry and why, you um, you know, that could change the game completely. Um, but, you know, the, there are pros and cons with this kind of structure. The pros with a functional business structure where you have different activities grouped together is you have a degree of specialization. There's standardization as people share best practices in that particular team and they agree on standards and the best way to do things so that makes them very efficient. The cons though this kind of structure is that can kind of lead to silos forming. So you've got the finance colleagues all working in their little area. They're not really interacting with marketing. Marketing isn't really interacting with production. Uh, you kind of have little rivalries, little kingdoms building up that can lead to conflict between areas and uh, it, it slows things down as well because different teams aren't really communicating with each other and um, you have duplication of tasks. You have one team going ahead with something, you know, the design team goes ahead with something that production cannot possibly put into practice. So there are the dangers with, um, with, a, with a functional structure that you need to be aware of. So production, a primary activity, obviously, and definitely an area, I think, as we'll see in a few slides time, that is in need of improvement. So Gavin is overseeing this. You have the mattress production the beds production, and then you've got a maintenance manager. So you've got 25% of the total manpower um, sitting here. Are the bed manufacturers and the mattress manufacturers actually collaborating? Because obviously one goes with the other, so it makes sense for them to communicate and to work closely together. Finance, headed up by Stephen Tang. Una Volk, important person because you are likely to be interacting with Una more than anyone else on the day of the exam. So you're going to be getting emails and prompts from Una to help her uh, resolve different problems. And then you've got the finance team sitting under Una. You've got three senior finance officers. So, uh, you know, they're sitting above you. As I said, you're pretty low down 
although you're not the lowest, you're not on the lowest rung of the ladder, at least there are three finance assistants, you're in the middle there. You're one of five finance officers. So day of the exam, you're going to be dealing with other finance officers, other senior finance officers, um, the finance manager, quite a lot. Maybe occasionally you'll deal with Stephen Tang and you might occasionally be dealing with people from other functional areas um, um, on occasion, okay?